Good morning. If there is one thing that this channel has taught me is that I do not know how to be short-winded, concise, brief. Today we're going to talk about 14 books. 14 books that I want to read in 2021 that I mentioned in my reading and channel goals for the new year. My unread books. At the time that I made that video, I had 16 books. Thanks to staying up till two in the morning last night when I didn't need to, but I really wanted to, to finish one of them. I am now down to 14 books. This is going to be a TBR. If you're familiar with my channel, you know that I do not make TBRs. I tend not to enjoy watching them, but I wanted to try something new, see if perhaps because this is an overview of what I'm going to be reading for the year, it'll still give me flexibility to choose the things that I'm in the mood for, the things that I really want to read. For example, the book that I read last night was not even the book that I was originally looking for. Got three chapters into it and were like, bet, this is where my evening is going. <laughs> so I'm hopeful that by just giving you kind of an overview about where this channel will be going for the rest of the year, with a couple other books that I do not currently have, but I will definitely definitely be reading like Truth of the Divine, which is the Axiom's End sequel, and Parable of the Talents, uh, the Octavia Butler sequel. This might be interesting. And then <laughs> it also will be a bit of a time capsule because once we get to the end of the year, we'll see if I have achieved my goal of reading all of my unread books. So to start, we have Women Who Run With The Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Woman Archetype. Now, I bought this book solely off of the marketing. On the back, we have Women Who Run With Wolves isn't just another book, it is a gift of profound insight, wisdom, and love. Alice Walker. And I am grateful to Women Who Run With Wolves and the work shows the reader how glorious it is to be daring and caring and to be women. Everyone who can read should read this book, Maya Angelou. Now, I have done minimal work with uh, the collective unconscious, with Carl Jung, with archetypes, and mainly through like, you know, intro to psych courses, but also uh, certain theater courses that pull from that framework. I am very, very curious to learn more about the wild woman archetype and especially how that plays in to race and culture, seeing as the uh, author and uh, all of the <laughs> reviews from those amazing women on the back are people of color. Uh, this is something that I tried reading last year and realized I needed to be in the right mindset because it's not not, because while it's not dry and impersonal like an academic text like it is dense like it is very much research based and so i find i have to be in the right mood for that but i am excited to read this in 2021. Next, we have The Best of H.P. Lovecraft, Blood Curdling Tales of Horror and the Macabre. This was a gift by a friend who knew I really loved horror movies and scary movies, but noticed that I wasn't reading a lot of scary books and figured that I might want to learn where we get the term Lovecraftian from. Uh, this is a collection of his stories, so I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to read some of them. I do not know if I'm going to read all of them, because in preparation for this video, even though I don't always Google authors, I like I had a tingling in the back of my brain. Like my antenna was like, mm, this man did something problematic. Like I don't know what it is, but I feel it. Maybe I read it somewhere. And there are a number of things, but the one that really stuck out to me when I was doing research was his poem, beautifully titled On the Creation of Niggers, about how we are more beasts than men. Now, a lot of conversations happening on the platform right now about separating art from the artist and death of the author. But while I'm still interested in trying some of his writing, because this was a gift and it wasn't something that I was super passionate about, it's not gonna break my heart to not finish this book. But, you know, it's, it does affect my perception of the book and I couldn't remember what that thing was. But the fact that I was like, H.P. Lovecraft, why do I, like it, was, it wasn't just like, I was like, oh, this is a book written a long time ago by a white person. Must automatically have done something wrong. Like I had something tingling back there, but I will definitely be reading some of these stories. If I like them, I might finish them. If I don't, I won't. But I'm kind of like iffy on this one based on the author, but we shall see. Uh, the next book, speaking of Maya Angelou, is Gather Together in My Name. This is the chronological sequel to I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. I reread that in 2020 and I, apparently I forgot that she actually had a series of books as her full autobiography. So I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings ended when she was a teenager and she just had her child. So I'm assuming that this is gonna be right around that time, maybe like right before or right after the Great War. Um, sorry, the Great War was the first one, I'm sorry. The uh, World War II. Yeah, she's 17, which means it would be the 40s. Um, I did not realize it was gonna be so short when I picked this off of a thrift books, but I'm excited because I really loved, uh, I know why the Cage Bird sings and I got so much more out of it reading it again as an adult. And while I probably will not finish all of them in 2021, I do want to work through Maya Angelou's entire life. So this is going to be the second stop on the journey of her amazing, wondrous, difficult, triumphant life. 
Next, we have Blood Child by Octavia E. Butler. A uh, funny story about this, I actually was unfamiliar with this book, even though I have just recently discovered the beauty and the grace and the majesty of Octavia Butler. But uh, Books by Lainess commented on one of my videos saying that she was probably gonna start with Blood Child as her first introduction to Butler's work. And then lo and behold, without me sharing that information with anybody, I got this book for Christmas. So this is a collection of short stories. Um, I This will be the fourth fourth Octavia Butler book I have read. And I'm just excited. Um, I really, I, so far I've read Parable of the Sower, Kindred, and Mind of My Mind. I haven't read a collection of short stories in a long time, with the exception of rereading Skin by Roald Dahl. But that was a reread. I already knew I was going to enjoy it. So I'm really interested to see if I enjoy her work, her prose, her vision as much in shorter form. Because with the other three books, Kindred, Parable of the Sower, and Mind of My Mind, I couldn't imagine those books as, as short stories because there was just so much going on and I wanted to go so deep into the world. I'm hopeful that this will not feel unsatisfying. I'm hopeful that this will not just make me want full length novels for every single short story she writes, but I am excited. Also, I really love this cover. Like these types of covers that don't tell you like exactly what's happening in the book, but seem to evoke a certain feeling, a certain tone. I'm finding myself really drawn to them. I'm finding myself uh, drawn to them recently. So also shout out for the uh, cover design of this. Next, we have Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. So you may remember me mentioning this book in my Black Booktuber tag in 2020 because I started reading it then and did not finish it. Uh, this is a collection of her speeches and her essays. And because of that, it's not something you need to read all in one sitting. It's not, and I think in some of them aren't even in chronological order. So I read a couple, enjoyed them, put it down. But I think in order to finish this, I'm going to need to just like sit down and power through it or else I may forget to come back to it. As someone who has interacted with Lorde's work in like snippets and bits and pieces, you know, clips from interviews and quotes that have been turned into aesthetic Instagram posts. I already experienced this, so I'm excited to experience more of it, but I am really excited to continue that journey of experiencing the context around what she was saying. You know, like there are so many quotes that we see everywhere that, you know, can inspire us and, you know, get us out of bed in the morning, remind us to take a break, remind us about what it means to be alive, to be black, to be a woman in this country. But reading them and being like, okay, this quote actually came from this speech that she gave in Berlin on this year. And it was like the start of the Afro-German movement, like context really is everything. And I'm excited to finally hear her words from her own voice in her own special edition book. Also, I think this is beautiful. I love it. This was a, um, a gift for myself. I walked into Barnes and Noble being like, I'm buying something for me, something pretty. And this is <laughs> what I got. So Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. Uh, next, uh, how do I talk about these books? Well, I'll talk about them together. We have Rooftops of Tehran and we have A Teaspoon of Earth and Sea. This one is set in America and in Tehran in the 80s and it's two sisters whose relationship spans time, space, distance when one of them is taken to America and one stays in their home country. And this is set in the 70s and has a non-linear storyline. So although I know what happened in Tehran in the 70s so far, because I actually got partway through this, the main character is a young teenage boy who's in love with his neighbor, who's already betrothed to someone else, who's a really passionate, great best friend, trying to help his best friend through his own stuff and trying to figure out his place in the world. The reason I don't know much about these books, and frankly, I don't sound very excited about them, is because I bought them in one of my like, like in a fugue state. And this is how that happened. Here's a little insight into my brain. I was in an academic course. We were talking about donor relations. It reminded me of the fact that the most uh, wealthy donors I've ever worked with were Persian people from Iran. And that phrasing struck me. So I'm like, why did I say that? Oh, right, they said that. Whenever people ask where they were from, they said Iran. But if people ask them, what are they? And by people, I mean white people. They said Persian. Why is that? I entered a downward spiral of Googling and Wikipedia about the Persian empire, the historical and geographic boundaries of what constituted as Persia, what constituted as of Iran. I got into politics and figuring out when people were refugees, when people mainly immigrated, uh, the political connotations of identifying as either Persian or Iranian. It became this whole thing. I blacked out, I woke up, and there are these two books <laughs> set in Iran on my doorstep. And that's how my brain works, and that's why I had to uh, get of one click buy on Amazon. So I'm interested, like the plots seem interesting. I, the only books that I've ever read uh, with, you know, uh, authors and protagonists from this part of the world have been Persepolis or were the, th uh, the two Persepolis books, which were great. And okay, learning about new culture, learning about new people, trying new authors. 
Uh, I don't have much to say about them because I really did impulsively buy them, but I did not unhaul them because I didn't want to get rid of them without at least trying them. They might be DNFs and I say that, well, I shouldn't say that about this one. I have not started this one. I started this book and the prose was not for me, uh, but it wasn't so bad that it wanted to make me stop reading. So I'm not committing to finishing either of these because unlike every other book on this list that I either actively wanted the book or bought it myself or I've been, you know, been talking about it, someone got to me as a gift, these are the wild cards. So we shall see, but I will definitely try to read them this year. I will start reading them and see where that takes me. <laughs> Uh, the next book on my list is The Iger Sanction by Trevanian. Now, depending on where you buy this book, because clearly this is an old copy, uh, the author might be Whitaker. And that's because Whitaker and Trevanian are the same person. This author had tons of pseudonyms, was very, very secretive about their, uh, his identity for his entire life. And that's why, and apparently for some reason, wrote some books under different names. So this is about a art dealer, slash collector, slash mountaineer, slash assassin for the US government. Uh, this <laughs> sounds a bit out of the ordinary for me, if you know my channel, because I don't really read assassin books, but one of my favorite books ever, which happens to star an assassin, is Shibumi, which is also by Trevanian. This book was written before Shibumi, and this book was adapted into a movie starring Clint Eastwood in which a stunt double died trying to replicate a scene that was in this book. And because of what happened to that person, Every other book that Trevanian wrote after that, he intentionally wrote the action scenes differently to discourage any major Hollywood studio from trying to adapt them literally, like word for word, scene for scene, and causing someone else's death. So considering that this book changed the way he wrote for the future, and this book also stars, you know, an assassin, secret governments, a very cultured Renaissance man, which are all elements in Shibumi, which I loved. I thought this would be, I thought this would be a great follow-up, seeing as even though Shibumi is one of my favorite books of all time, I have never read any other books by that author. So this is The Iger Sanction. Next, we have a nonfiction text where Peachtree meets Sweet Auburn. As you'll notice, a lot of these books, because I'm about to say about this one, are things that I started and didn't get a chance to finish, but I really want to. Uh, two of Atlanta's most famous mayors are Ivan Allen Jr. and Maynard Jackson Jr. Uh, Ivan Allen being white, Maynard Jackson being black, and they're both descendants of two incredibly important families, Maynard being the descendants of the Dobbs family, uh, which were enslaved peoples, uh, Ivan Allen Jr. being the descendants of the Allens, who were slave owners. And this is about the history of Atlanta specifically through the histories of two of its most important families. So where Peachtree meets Sweet Auburn is a reference to the way the city is constructed. In many cities, but especially in Atlanta, a street will have one name, and then suddenly you'll be in the black side of town and have another name and it's the exact same street. Uh, the Sweet Auburn District is a historical site of you know, Ebenezer Baptist Church, You know a lot of protests and marches, culture, food, all these things. Peachtree, um, this is kind of a joke to me because if you are from Atlanta or been to Atlanta, you know that we literally have dozens of streets named Peachtree. So when I first saw it, I was like, which Peachtree is it? Like which Peachtree was the first Peachtree? Because we have so many that are named that. But I really love learning about the history of Atlanta. I really love living in a city with so much history. I know when we think about historical cities, many of us are like, oh yeah, New England. Like this was, you know, where, this is where the British attacked. This is where, I, I really like Southern history. I really like Atlanta history. And I got, I think about a hundred pages. Yeah, into this 500 something page book. And it was really fascinating. This was actually written by, I believe a journalist. Yeah, a reporter for the Atlanta Journal Constitution. And he writes like, I have read other like big tomes of historical information and I feel like he could have broken up several of these chapters based on what I had already read into like individual long form articles. Like there's something about reading a book written by a reporter that I feel like, I feel like he has a sense, I feel like he's a different sense of narrative than perhaps some other books I've read in a good way. And this was actually, I don't even wanna say a buddy read. Me and my friend were both like, we're gonna read it, we're gonna finish it in 2020. And then life happened. And the last time we saw each other, because she's living in London now, I was like, do you still have that book? She's like, do you still have that book? So we're gonna read it because either she doesn't leave live in Atlanta anymore, she's still fascinated by the history, as am I. And I think especially, who especially, uh, with the way politics are going in Georgia this year and the way, I mean, the way it always has been, but especially, conversations of race and class and generational wealth and privilege are playing out on a national stage. I think kind of looking at a microcosm of Atlanta and seeing how these two families, slave owners and descendants of slaves, both produce two of the most influential mayors in Atlanta's history with their own individual platforms that change the course of the growth of the city. 
I'm super excited for this. I am really excited for this, even if I am a bit intimidated by the length. Next, we have The Power by Naomi Alderman. This was a gift and it was actually something that I wasn't expecting. So I know very little about it. I know it's a science fiction novel in which for some reason, because I haven't read it yet, women and girls develop a particular power in which they can cause incredible amounts of pain with their hands, you know, by touching people. And that shifts the course of history and humanity because suddenly, women are not the physically weaker sex. Uh, this was actually the same friend who got me another book that I'll mention. Uh, he was like, hey, I just saw this book and I think you would like it. I feel like it wasn't even my birthday or something. He just got it for me. And I was super grateful and I wanted to keep it. Also, um, even though I mentioned how important uh, the author endorsements of Alice Walker and Maya Angelou were for me picking up the other book, Women Who Runs With Wolves, I'm not like a huge like, oh, if this author likes it, I'll like it. But when he bought me this book, I don't know if you can see this, uh, Margaret Atwood called it electrifying. It was this, like in it, within a few months of me reading The Handmaid's Tale. So I was like, oh, and I think that kind of led to my interest as well. Uh, so yeah, this is probably the book I know the least amount about, at least with my two Iranian books. I know how I got there, how I got to that subject matter. But again, as someone who's trying more science fiction, I'm excited for another science fiction type story. Uh, maybe it's fantasy actually. I mean, I don't, I went back to the bookstore and I've noticed that Butler's works are half of them are in fantasy, half of them are in science fiction. So I'm trying to figure out exactly where those boundaries are, but I'm excited to try something in that kind of range. Speaking of fantasy, something that I would consider like straight fantasy, we have Aberat by Clive Barker. Uh, this is the first in a series of three novels about Candy Quackenbush, who's a regular everyday girl, or so you think, who gets pulled into the wonderful world of Aberat. Uh, this is Candy right here, Candy Quackenbush, which is an archipelago of uh, 25 islands, each for a different uh, hour of the day in this fantasy world. This is the only young adult book that I read growing up that I still have. And one of the reasons was I absolutely loved all of the beautiful paintings and illustrations. All of these were uh, painted and designed by Clive Barker. And I loved the opportunity to literally see what he saw in his head when he was writing this book. Um, because this is part of a trilogy, and I said one of my goals for 2021 was to finally read a trilogy or read a series. If I like this, if I enjoy this reread, I'll read the second two books. Uh, another thing I just love about his artwork, I forget the, the official name for this, but as you'll see, this says Aberat. And when you flip it upside down, it still says Aberat. Um, I'm not sure if I'll have to like do anything for the footage for you to see that, but I also thought that was really cool when I was a kid and really cool now. Um, this type of you know, like just fantastic, ephemeral magic and uh, curses and various creatures and goblins. Like this type of fantasy is something that I don't read. And I say this type of, because as I said, certain Octavia Butler books apparently are fantasy, but I'm excited. I'm excited for the escapism. I'm excited to lose myself in a fantastical world in which I am fairly positive that good will triumph over evil and a young woman will defeat the evil big bad guys. I really am looking forward to uh, that kind of story. So I hope that's what that is because, I mean, you know why, you know why we want a little escapism. But seeing as this is the only YA book that I kept of all the books that I, re I read when I was younger, all of these Sarah Dessen books and Twilight and just things that as I got older, I knew I didn't want to revisit. I'm not trying to give this too high of expectations. Like I'm not expecting this to be like my new favorite book, but I hope I can still enjoy it because I'm gonna be sad if I kept it for all these years on the hope that one day I'll reread it and like it. And it just, it, it should have remained a fond memory. So we shall see. This next book I'm uh, got some feelings about, and that is Anna Karenina by Leo, Tol Leo Tolstoy. If you go back and watch my very first booktube video, uh, I mentioned this book and I have mentioned it in multiple videos since because I have been reading it for like years. Okay, so what had happened was I got like 200 something pages in, took too long of a break and had to start over. I was like, I can't remember anything. I need to know what's happening. Then last year I got to page 355 and I don't know if you know anything about Russian literature. I didn't. This is this is one of my best. This was a, a book from my best friend. It was a gift from her ex. She did not want it. I was like, you know what? I love you and you love Russian literature and I love reading. Let me try some of your Russian lit. Nobody told me. Nobody told me how many conversations there would be about farming. 
how many conversations there would be about the peasantry and serfdom and the best way to get your peasants to do what you need them to do. Nobody told me there'll be so many conversations about Russian politics. And I'm like, I am here for the excellent writing, the satire, the wit that this has. I am here for the agony, the yearning, the drama, the, you know, toward relationship between the main character, Anna Karenina, and her lover, and all the tension and back and forth between her and her husband, and the choices that she has to make a woman constrained by the, you know, the, the, uh, the constrained by her high class and aristocracy and what she can get away with, what she can't. All of that is fantastic. Like the character work is fantastic. The description of the interpersonal relationships, the humor like I had no idea that this book would be so funny considering how much drama there is in it like there are parts that I genuinely laughed out loud because it was just so witty and delightful but oh my gosh like I can do long books I know I said I was intimidated by some stuff but even in Jane Eyre which I loved every time she's like I went for a walk across the moor and I'm like okay 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 plants 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 sky plants rock okay next now now to the characters but I'm gonna finish it. I said I was gonna finish it and I am. And will I ever pick up another book of Russian literature? Who knows? At some point before I die, I wanna read Two Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky because that's her favorite book, my best friend's favorite book of all time. But I, I, I cannot think of any other book in my life that has that was written so well, that was still so hard to get through. But 2021, it's gonna be the year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna claim it. Um, and the next two books we have are gifts that also have beautiful covers. Uh, the first is The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. He is also the author of The Nickel Boys, which I haven't read, but I want to. Uh, this story follows an enslaved young woman who is, you know, escaping to freedom on the Underground Railroad. And if that sounds too straightforward, then you should take a look at this beautiful cover and let that be a hint, because in this book, this science fiction, speculative fiction book, the Underground Railroad is a literal railroad, like an actual train with conductors and stops and a full network under the earth. Uh, this was a gift from my partner back when he was working at Barnes and Nobles. Again, it was something he was like, hey, I saw this and I thought you'd like it. Also thought it was a beautiful book. And I was like, yes, it absolutely is. I planned on reading this last year and then happened to pick up Kindred. And I was like, okay, one, one of the best books I've ever read, as I've said, but also I can't go from like book with slavery to book with slavery to book with slavery. So I put this down, even though it was technically on my TBR of last year, but I'm super excited to read it this year. And again, science fiction, fantasy, speculative, like I'm really trying to like move into that. And I'm excited actually at how many books I have that I was already interested in that happened to fall in that genre. Every, everything I learned about genres is now making me realize one, it's a lot more arbitrary and nebulous than I thought it was, but two, just by following my instincts or following things that I find interesting, I think I'm actually reading more diversely than I originally thought, but I just had very, very narrow ideas of what that genre is. Like there was absolutely a point where I'm like, okay, if there aren't, as I said in another video, if there aren't fairies and goblins and ghouls and ghosts and magic, then it's not fantasy. And if there's not like actual robots or cyborgs or aliens, it's not sci-fi. And I just, I don't know where I got that from, but anyway, Here's to reading more books in general, but also more genres. The final book I want to talk about is The Island of Sea Women. Uh, this story is about two young women who are from different classes, you know, different social classes, but who both, like and this is a real photo because I ended up Googling it, who both are part of the all woman diving team on Jeju Island, which is uh, in Korea. And this is set in the 30s and 40s. And you know, time and politics and society starts to pull these two women apart who have, who have had this such incredible friendship. And this was something that I actually read like a chapter chapter or two standing like standing up in an airport just like while I was waiting for a plane I am a sucker for buying books at the airport so I'm like it's the perfect time to you know find something new because I had never heard of Lisa C before I had never heard of the tea girl of hummingbird lane even though apparently that's a New York be New York Times best-selling book but I am really excited about this and it's beautiful and unrelated to the actual you know, character relationships, which is what first drew me in, this idea of these two best friends joined together by this hobby that then get pulled apart. This is set on Jeju Island, as I said, and last year, actually 2019 to 2020, I worked on a new musical that uh, was set on Jeju Island and ended up learning a lot about Korean culture and uh, in Korea. And I actually also read Pachinko in 2019, 2020, which follows a Korean family over several generations. And solely because of those fictional uh, experiences with Korean culture, 
it has just kind of like fed this desire to learn even more. Like I, I, I never really thought much about, uh, you know, South Korea now, because obviously I wouldn't go visit North Korea. I never really thought much about South Korea in my modern life. And, and I never really thought about it when it came time for me to decide where I wanted to travel. But simply based on what I have learned through these fictional stories and the research I have done for them, I am really, really excited to hopefully one day get to visit South Korea and specifically get to visit uh, Jeju Island. So I hope that those actually all add up to 14 because I counted them before the video started, but those are the books that I want to read in 2021 in some particular order. I'm not saying those are the only books I'm gonna read. I'm not saying that those are the only books you're gonna see on this channel, but that gives you an idea of what I'm trying to accomplish what things have been sitting on my shelves for either years or maybe even a few months. And if I end up enjoying this process and if I end up actually sticking with this year long TBR, maybe I'll try more videos like this in the future. As I said in one of my other videos, I do wanna to try to branch out more. So even though this is something that I thought, oh, I'll never do because I don't like being held accountable for certain books, maybe I will end up liking it. And maybe that accountability will be fun. And maybe we can, you know, plan buddy reads or, or if you guys have ideas of things that you might want me to do with these books coming up. But yep, that was my first TBR. These are some of the books that I'll be reading in 2021. I am really excited to hear what you have planned either for this month or sometime this year. And as always, I hope you have a good day. Bye.